My name is Yashar Tonta. I'm here to present our, our third uh, keynote speaker today. And um, <clears throat> we are very fortunate to have Mr. Marshall Breeding here as, as one of the keynote speakers um, because uh, he's probably in the best position to tell us about cloud computing and uh, its effects on library and information uh, profession because um, his book on um, uh, cloud computing in libraries came out from Neil Schumann uh, last year. So I don't know of any other specific book that uh, talks about uh, cloud computing in libraries. Uh, Mr. Marshall Breeding is an independent uh, consultant, uh, speaker, and as I said, the author of the book uh, entitled uh, Cloud Computing in Libraries. He is also the creator and editor of Library Technology Guides and uh, the LibWebCats online directory of libraries on the web. His monthly column, Systems Librarian, appears in Computers in Libraries. He is also the editor for Smart Libraries newsletter published by the ALA. <clears throat> and he has authored the annual Automation Marketplace feature published by Library Journal since 2002. He has authored nine issues of ALA's library technology reports and has written many other articles and book chapters. By the way, library technology reports is an excellent source to um, you know, um, know more about uh, library automation software packages as well as other um, IT developments uh, in the field. <coughs> Mr. Marshall uh, has edited or authored um, seven books, including the one I mentioned, uh, uh, now part of a LaTeX source, Neil Schumann's, uh, as a publisher. He regularly teaches workshops and gives presentations at library conferences on a wide range of topics. He's a regular presenter at library conferences, including Computers in Libraries and the Internet Librarian. Uh, he has been a Lita Top Technology Trends Panelist at ALA conferences and uh, an invited speaker for many library conferences and workshops throughout the United States and internationally. He has spoken in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Czech Republic, Austria, Germany, and many other countries. Mr. Marshall Breeding held a variety of positions for the Vanderbilt University Libraries in Nashville, Tennessee from 1985 through May 2012, including as the Director for Innovative Technologies and Research, as the Executive Director of the Vanderbilt Tele Television News Archive. He was the 2010 recipient of the LITA uh, Library High Tech Award for Outstanding Communication for Continuing Education in Library and Information Science. So uh, we are looking forward to uh, his talk today on cloud computing. A new generation of technology enables, enables deeper collaboration. Mr. Drayden. So I want to spend the next hour talking about my view of the realm of library management systems, uh, how cloud computing is affecting that realm. Uh, you know, it, it's a realm that I follow pretty closely. You know, it is uh, you know, rapidly changing. I think we're in interesting times in terms of where libraries are going, uh, where library technology is going, and where the automation systems that libraries use um, are changing as well. Uh, we'll talk about it in kind of three different parts, uh, if I get to all of it before I run out of time. I uh, want to talk about kind of the, the realm of discovery systems and services that, that libraries offer to provide access to the, their, their resources and their services. Talk some about resource sharing uh, arrangements and uh, that like how, do you, how does a library give access to more than what it has itself and then talk some about the back-end library management systems. There are interesting things happening in all three of those categories, and I think cloud computing has a big impact on all of them as well. Uh, first, kind of breeze through some of the things that I want to show you regarding uh, how I gather research and, and, and disseminate it. Uh, it seems like every breath I take has something to do with gathering or disseminating information related to the realm of 
library technologies of some sort. So Library Technology Guides is the website that I've been maintaining since about 1997, I think. How many websites have been around that long? It has a variety of components, all of which help me gather information, store information, as I have all these multiple deadlines every month. Uh, uh, you heard some of these publications that I uh, am involved with. Uh, I have two looming deadlines as we speak. Uh, so I, anytime I get a tidbit of information, it goes into this website. So it's kind of at my disposal, at the public's disposal, um, as necessary. It has a database of libraries that includes the you know, just basic information about the library, where it is, its address, phone number, that gets used by the general world. For those of us who care about automation systems, it also carries details for each library, to the extent I can, about the automation systems it uses and has used previously, discovery systems, link resolvers, all those kinds of things. Uh, it allows me to kind of generate reports with a link uh, to be able to uh, look at any given country, uh, city, whatever, about the automation systems that are in use. I was in Sweden recently, so I had this slide handy. Uh, interesting things are happening in Denmark, I'll mention lately. So here are the public libraries and its current automation systems for uh, public libraries. I care about what automation systems libraries acquire new each year and which ones they move away from. So here is a report that's generated out of the website. For those of you who brought your binoculars, you might be able to see it. Uh, but basically it shows in a given year, and I think this is 2012 data, if I, I don't have the label showing, of what systems were selected. And this is kind of slanted toward the US, but it's worldwide uh, to a certain extent. And more interesting, what systems were replaced. You know, what is the churn of systems? What, what, what do libraries move away from every year? What systems are they selecting? You know, you don't really want to be acquiring a new system that other libraries are abandoning, so I think this is really very useful information. This report does the same thing in a different way, starting off with, well, what are library systems that people have moved away from, uh, and then what did they select? Uh, Sometimes it's good to be on this list, and sometimes it's not. For example, you see on the, the top list, top of this list is Millennium. Well, people are leaving Millennium in droves, but they are moving towards Sierra, the company's next generation system. So that's probably a pretty good sign for innovative. But you look at other systems where the systems that are uh, being re that are replacing it are com competing systems, and so it's not so good to be on this list in that. In, in those cases, but you no. Know, needless to say, you know th this. I think is useful information that you know by using by mining the data that I maintained in this website since 1996, are able to kind of see the momentum of the library software industry, which is I think pretty interesting. Companies come and go. Um, it's interesting to kind of watch that anytime you acquire. Technology, you acquire an automation system. It's something that you'll probably use for around 10 years or more. You want to bet that that company is going to be in business during that time. It's no fun for a library to acquire a system and then a couple of years later uh, have that company get acquired and have to think about, well, what am I going to do now? The change process in libraries happens very slowly. And libraries tend to uh, not favor kind of disruptive change. Uh, the times that there has been disruptive change, uh, you know, I think that it is you know, not necessarily caused, gone well for the companies that elicited that change. They, they, libraries move to competitors pretty quickly if they feel like the company uh, is not treating library, the library in particular and the library community in general very well. So it's real interesting to watch the business and the politics and the dynamics of the products, the companies, the technologies. Uh, it's kind of what I spend my life doing. This is just another view of the same thing. You can see that we're in a time of consolidated businesses that provide technology to libraries. Uh, where you go back to the 1990s and before, it was a fragmented industry of a lot of companies and a limited economy with overlapping products that just wasn't tenable. The library software industry, like others, has consolidated to a fewer number of stronger players. You know, in some ways, it means there are fewer options open to libraries. 
I think we'll see in the course of the next hour that, li that new options have opened up as well over that time. So kind of a big picture of the library landscape. Another um, project that I do every year, as was mentioned, is the uh, Library Journal's Automation Marketplace. Uh, it is an industry report of the library technology sphere. I've been doing it since 2002, and every year we assign a tagline to the article that, in, that tries to kind of give you the gist of what happened in the industry that year. And you can see in recent years that the really, we've gone from kind of let's move from old systems to new systems uh, of the last generation to you know new innovations, kind of new sparks of of uh, systems being created and libraries moving to some of those changes. And in this last round of change, as we'll see in the next few minutes, it's really a more fundamental change than some of the ones that have happened in the past. And the kind of the boundaries of technology that have been expanded through cloud technology, I think, have a lot to do with that. The shape of any library's automation system can surely look different today uh, in an era where technology scales infinitely than in previous times where you were worried about you know, how many patrons, how many records can live on this one server in my library. So the world is changing pretty rapidly, I think, from this silo mentality of technology and automation to a much broader view of shared infrastructure in support of what libraries do. Uh, last year I did an issue of Library Technology Reports. It was published in this January talking about resource sharing. I'll bring some of that in as we uh, move along. And then cloud computing for libraries I think is a important topic, uh, important enough that I uh, thought it was worth writing a book about to kind of see what's going on in the realm of cloud computing and how are libraries embracing it or not, what flavors of cloud computing exist and how are they being implemented in libraries. If there's anything I've learned in all this study of library technologies is that libraries are pretty quirky compared to other industries. Uh, we're slow to change. We're sometimes on early adoption cycles, but more often than not, we have pretty slow adoption cycles in the technologies that we use uh, you know, to automate what libraries do. You know, it's interesting to see more theoretical presentations and information management courses and those kind of things, and you know, what's the distance between the theoretical work that's done and kind of the technology on the ground in libraries as far as how we provide access to our content, our services, and automate what we do. Uh, I'm often frustrated by the distance there. I uh, would often wish that you know, this change cycles in libraries were kind of a bit more aligned with you know, the technology that happens in research and development. It's so important for libraries to have the right automation infrastructure for what they do. Um, you know, I, I certainly believe that technology never exists for itself, but to support the strategic mission of what a library does. So to help libraries be better libraries is you know, what I think good technology should do. Uh, but so often I see a mismatch between what a library does, its aspirations, what it wants to do, and the technology that they're using inside the library. Uh, you know, the, the most glaring issue these days are libraries having automation systems that are just tightly bound around the model of print borrowing and, and collections, where most libraries are fully engaged in electronic and digital collections, and, you know, especially in public libraries, circulation of print materials continues to be vigorous, but in academic and research libraries, that's becoming a smaller and smaller piece of what libraries do. So sometimes it's more of a problem when those libraries are bound to automation systems that are heavily rooted in print. So uh, I hope to see some realignment of that. Uh, so it's no news to anyone in this room that libraries have gone through fundamental change in the last decade. Or <laughs> change happens year by year. But you think about how libraries were a decade ago or even two, you can see that libraries are just fundamentally different. When I began my uh, position at Vanderbilt University, you know, it was the days of having kind of shelves and shelves of bound periodicals that are now kind of all either discarded or in remote storage and have been replaced by, you know, subscriptions to electronic articles online. So that's a pretty major shift. 
the shift now is taking place more on the monograph side of the house. Uh, I think that research libraries continue to have kind of very large legacy print collections, but I also observe that the acquisition of print materials is drastically down from previous years. So, you know, that, that's a pretty major change, and do we have technologies that help us manage not only the change, but the, the reality as those trend lines continue the forward trajectory toward more electronic, more digital, and less print. You know, I'm not one who believes that libraries will ever be all digital, but I think the proportions are certainly going to change over time, and certainly in favor of the digital and the print. So, in my view, basically we need automation systems that are robust at electronic resources, digitized resources that can also do print. And right now I think we're doing well to have it the other way around. Systems that are developed for print and how can we make them do electronic resources? Not so well. And then what about all these digital assets? Well, we'll do those separately. So that is kind of a major transition that's happened in libraries that, you know, technology has to uh, to catch up with. In some cases, I think half. That's, that's some of the more optimistic side of things in, in recent developments. Uh, how libraries deal with metadata is changing very rapidly. Uh, well, not rapidly enough. We've been doing MARC for you know 30 years or so, and it seems to be uh, the dominant metadata format in libraries. Uh, but also we're beginning to use lots of other metadata formats, Dublin Core, VRA, and other kinds of specialized XML-oriented metadata for digital collections. We've gone through kind of painful transition even within the MARC realm from AACR2 to RDA for hardly any gain. Uh, you know, being, you know, some of you may have met my wife, she's a cataloger at Vanderbilt, and have, they spent the last two years kind of making this transition from Anglo-American cataloging rules to RDA, and how much has it really advanced the way that we deal with metadata? Hardly any. It's been painful, it's been expensive, at really a bad time in libraries where the resources for technical services are fewer than they, that, that they've ever been, and you know, technical services units all over uh, the U.S. and I'm sure other places are kind of under siege. Why are you spending all this time cataloging books in MARC when you have all these other aspects of your collection that are wholly un undescribed? So, you know, RDA has been kind of a hard uh, transition, but you haven't seen anything yet when you compare that to the major transition that we're facing in the future with mapping MARC into the linked data realm that's now happening in the conversations uh, kind of known as BibFrame. The Library of Congress's uh, initiative on bibliographic transformation, you know, has sprouted this project called bibframe.org, where they're doing mapping of MARC into uh, RDF triple stores and, and other concepts of open link data. And that is certainly going to require major changes in the realm of library technologies to operationalize that. So, you know, I, I worry that we spent a small, a large amount of effort making a small change when there's this big change that, that stands in front of us, and I hope we're able to navigate that change uh, a, lot, a lot more effectively, a lot faster. Technologies are changing rapidly. Uh, you know, we're now in a, a paradigm shift, I think is what uh, was it Cliff that said it uh, yesterday, or was it the morning uh, keynote, where we're really in a paradigm shift, away from local computing toward web-based and cloud computing. It's the way computing is done, increasingly done in the business realm and other business sectors, uh, other I ICT sectors. You know, all are trying to figure out how to make this transition away from, you know, local infrastructure to, you know, some flavor of, of cloud computing. There are lots of different flavors of it. Uh, how can we get away from clients you install on desktops that are extremely difficult for libraries to manage, especially a large library? When you get the new version of the library management system, you have to have some scheme for updating 500 clients through the library. That's not much fun. It's, there are probably better things to do with our time. The world is moving to web-based interfaces, so regardless of whether you know, the server component is cloud-based or locally based, this transition to web-based interfaces I think is especially helpful and I, and I think important. 
Uh, it also uh, means more flexibility, I hope, in supporting the, the mobile devices that most of our users use. I would say that most library users these days expect to consume our services this way and not this way. Uh, so if we don't have kind of fully mobile enabled uh, interfaces for patrons, you're losing an increasing portion of your customers kind of year by year as these adoption cycles kind of go further toward mobile platforms. So I really worry about that. That's one thing I see in the library automation space that is kind of sluggish, I think, relative to um, to other things that I see is, is kind of responsive web design, uh, kind of uh, integrated mobile apps, all these kind of things that make library content and services easy to use for mobile users. So this fundamental shift, uh, when I started in libraries, it was the big mainframes, million dollar mainframe to run an auto, a you know, library automation system, shifted to client server computing, that kind of came in in kind of say the mid 1990s, those systems were sold to the late 1990s, early 2000, and some of them continue to be sold. But I tell you, no one would build a client server system from scratch these days that is pretty much a computing paradigm that is almost as obsolete today as mainframes would be. It's just inconceivable that a software developer would say, well, I'm going to ramp up and build a mainframe-based system today. Well, you look at some web-based systems, they look a little mainframe-ish, but uh, again, the, tech, the preferred technology architecture has drifted further and further away from classic client-server computing and evolving, if not revolutionizing, toward web-based and, uh, and cloud computing architectures. So pretty big change. So it's a, it's a major trend. But it's also kind of a trend of use, I would say, that, you know, a few years ago, I think a lot of vendors were trying to convince libraries that cloud computing is relatively okay, that it's safe, that, you know, it's going to be the way of the world. And, but now we're in a, in a stage where cloud computing is the buzzword, where uh, almost as much as the other dreaded term uh, Web 2.0 was uh, a while back. So everyone wants to say that their products are in the cloud, whether they are or not. So you've got to be really careful about understanding kind of the architecture, what these things are made out of. That was a big point of, you know, the book that I did on cloud computing for libraries is to help folks in libraries understand, you know, what is kind of a transformational use of cloud computing that can help libraries do what they do better and what's the same old, same old, but hosted by a vendor. So that's really a pretty important difference that, you know, I think that, you know, libraries would do well to pay attention to as they think about you know, when and whether they want to move some of their basic technology services to a cloud environment. Cloud washing is a term that you see in a lot of trade journals these days where all of a sudden a vendor has something, has the same product that's now being marketed using uh, cloud marketing terms. So you, you have to be uh, cognizant of that, especially in the library space when hosted client server systems are positioned as software as a service. And yeah, you can say that to a certain extent, but it's different than a true multi-tenant modern software as a service native application. There are some things you get that way and some things you don't. I actually think both are pretty positive moves for libraries. I think libraries have a lot of better things to do with the technology talent than babysit servers. Um, you know, it's the one thing that I think we spend a lot of our technology resources doing that's not necessarily within our core expertise. I was on a panel uh, last year, I think it was, with a VP from Amazon. Uh, so he was talking about, you know, their different uh, infrastructure facilities. And he said for this one facility, it was I think it was the East Coast facility, we have 200 security engineers on staff. So, you know, they know how to do things at scale at the highest level. And, you know, that was just security. You know, they have database specialists. They have specialists for every layer of the stack so that it's industrial strength and reliable. And those are the things you have to do on a small scale in a library if you're going to do kind of server-based computing responsibly. 
And I would say that most libraries kind of live by good luck when it comes to uh, security and, and, and other issues on maintaining library management and so forth, library management systems, you know, because, you know, the, the security that you can do in your spare time in a library is not, is not what you can get when you're dealing with folks who kind of do that as their core business. So some perspective there. So, you know, you know as well as me what the characteristics of cloud computing are, web-based interfaces, externally hosted at least in, in some way or another, uh, often priced through a utility model. In the library realm, it's mostly annual subscriptions based on the size and complexity of the library. Uh, provisioned on demand, so you can scale up and scale down as you need to. That's kind of where the elastic comes from, right? You can it'll snap back to a smaller size if you, if you need it to. Um, been watching, all of us watch kind of the Gartner hype cycles, so it's interesting to see where cloud computing has fallen in that the last few years. Uh, here's a, a grab from the 2009 hype cycle, and it shows where kind of cloud computing in general was put. Uh, kind of advanced a little bit the next year. Uh, in 2011, they have a whole hype cycle of all the different pieces and parts of, of uh, cloud tech, of cloud tech, not 2012, I mean. Uh, so you can see that it is, there are pieces of cloud computing that are really quite mature by today. So, you know, there are parts of the cloud computing ecosystem that, you know, are really more in the research and development ramp up phase, but there are plenty of cloud-based technologies that are well within kind of the lower risk uh, production cycle. I'm sure you've seen those. Talk just for a second about, you know, what we mean by software as a service. And we know uh, some of the risks about it from uh, previous keynotes that, you know, it's not, you know, you, you know, you lose a bit of control uh, over software when you are uh, having it deployed to you as a service and not, lo not on your local hardware. So given all of those caveats, you know, it really has a lot of positive advantages as well. When you think from the software developer's point of view, uh, you can develop, you know, software of a single code base that serves all of your institutional customers branded for each institution and subdivided within institutions accordingly. Uh, so like for Gmail, you know, you can have Gmail that only you see your own account, you can have shared folders for your institution. So the technologies are well established for partitioning multi-tenant software as a service so that you see what you should see and you don't see what you shouldn't see, uh, you know, as that is same code base is deployed across multiple organizations and within that organization used by multiple departments and individuals. So the, you know, you want to make sure that it acts pretty much like local software does, even though there's this one code base. When there's one code base, you know, it's easy to fix bugs. You fix it once for everyone. You roll out new features in a much more automatic way. Kind of the rational way to do that is as a developer has a new feature, you know, they, they kind of make it available in a test mode. You have some kind of administrative console. You can choose when to activate that new feature. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a change in existing feature, but hopefully they, if they're doing it a fairly reasonable change management approach, you're able to accept and reject, at least for a limited amount of time, new features as, as they come much more efficient way to uh, deliver and use software, I think. Um, it also enables kind of transformative things. You can make it work just like local software. Well, big deal. But what it allows you to do is kind of be bigger than your own organization. You can start thinking about having uh, data services that span, you know, the whole library community, that span, uh, you know, whatever a reasonable group is to consume a particular uh, set of data, whether it be bibliographic records, whether it be open URL linking uh, data, whether it be indexes, article level indexes on discovery systems. So once you really live in the true multi-tenant software as a service arena, 
then you're really able to break out of the one library silo mentality when it comes to the way that we build and share data. So I think that's a pretty important step for libraries and a pretty big advantage for moving to, to this realm of, of technology. So, um, as you've heard me say, I think that a lot of the library automation systems that are used in libraries today are built in a certain way around print. Uh, I see libraries all over organizing themselves around the traditional modules of the library management system. Here is our cataloging unit. Here's our circulation desk. Uh, here's our acquisitions department. Here's our interlibrary loan office where it's kind of a chicken and egg kind of scenario, but libraries are often organized according to the way that software was developed going on 30 years ago. I don't necessarily think that that's always the best model for libraries and that as we make the change from a certain set of legacy systems to the current next generation systems, it's also a time to think about how we organize what we do in libraries. That maybe what we need is something broader like fulfillment, where libraries take responsibility for getting materials to users independently of whether they own it or not. It's our problem, not theirs, where the stuff comes from. And by relegating the organization, by making the organization of libraries fit, you know, technology systems, you kind of, it's kind of hard to break out of that. Where, you know, you can't, no, I can't help you here. Can you go to our interlibrary loan office? Because we don't own that. Uh, you know, I think that we need a simpler approach, you know, based on modern needs of service delivery and the shape of modern library collections, not the traditional organization that's been in place for libraries for a long time. You can apply that to all these other categories, you know, think whether or not the organization of your own library is built around <coughs> strategic needs or built around kind of legacy concepts rooted in software or not. Libraries today demand more open systems. Uh, I think the days of closed box automation systems in any category are largely past. Libraries today, I think, want to do more with any given piece of software than it comes out of the box. You know, of course, you want certain functionality out of the box. You want your staff interfaces. You want a default public interface. But you want to do more. You always, you know, you want to use APIs and other kinds of uh, technology resources to do the things that are special to your library. We're past the days of kind of customizing code within an ILS. Today in the realm of cloud computing and service oriented architecture, uh, you know, we live within ecosystems of APIs where that's how systems talk to each other, that's how we extract data from them, that's how we extend functionality is by exploiting application programming interfaces that a organization that develops software makes available or not. If it doesn't, I think it's at its own peril because that, from what I hear, is what libraries are really interested in being able to do these days um, is you know, doing more with data, uh, you know, writing new aspects of functionality that you know, they need for, for their approach. So when I look at libraries today, I think of it two points of view. One is what do they show to their users? What do they offer to their users on their websites? And I know through my database of over 100,000 libraries that most follow a very disjointed approach. You look at the home page, the, the main web presence of any library, it's kind of a menu of silos. Here is our, here's our catalog. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, here's the discovery search. You know, here's our electronic resources. You know, all these different things that Often you have to know the library jargon pretty well to have any expectation of what they do or not uh, that I think most library users don't have. If you see a, if there's a search box there, they're going to type something in and see what happens. Uh, so I think that it's really important to think about kind of what the front door to your collection is. What is that search box? What's behind it? What is a patron, what is a user going to get back when they type something into it? Uh, so I would say that most uh, libraries have their catalog, their OPAC, as that front door to their collection. Uh, so if you're an academic library and, uh, and your patron 
type something into that, you know, I would say that we spend 80% of our resources on uh, journal articles and uh, that's probably what most students and graduate students are looking for. So they have the name of an author of an article that they want to find, they type it into your online catalog and what do they get? They don't get anything because it only has the mark records that have the journal title. And who knows how useful that is to uh, a lot of users in the way they search these days. If they type in the name of an article, of a title of an article, is it going to bring up anything? No, because it's a pretty limited scope. What you don't get is really more of the strategic assets of the library than the little bit that you do get. Not to denigrate, you know, the monograph collections and, you know, the, you know, all of the, the mark records that describe, you know, the the journal titles and DVDs that we have, but it's an increasingly small part of what library collections are made out of. So it's important, I think, to widen the scope of that front door to your collection. Beginning in about 2002, libraries began to realize how bad their online catalogs were, and so there was this wave of next generation catalogs. I wrote a book on that too. Uh, and it was mostly making cosmetic improvements. Uh, to have some faceted navigation instead of advanced search headings. Do you mean type ahead kind of things? A little bit of the interface functionality that was already well, uh, you know, expressed on the rest of the web. Uh, sometimes, you know, a little bit broader discovery. Uh, so you could have, you know, things like your local theses and dissertations put in that solar index that's associated with the discovery interface. You might have a meta search plugin that goes out and kind of slowly gets some articles related to a search, often with a kind of secondary kind of query. Uh, you know, the federated search, the meta search uh, that I'm talking about uses protocols like Z3950, some kinds of XML gateways uh, that have a lot of limitations. You know, they can only talk to maybe a dozen targets at a time very well. Better to have like six. Uh, they only, they send a query to the server, they get some results back. One of the secrets of C950 is that you get 30 back on the first uh, initial result set. So that's what you have to work with to do relevancy on. So if that query really would return 10,000 records, you've just got the first 30 and you're going to pretend to do relevancy on those and you don't even know what order they came back in. Are they the ones that begin with A? Or the, are they the oldest? Are they the newest? All these kinds of problems associated with federated search, but for a while it was the only way you could provide kind of broader exposure to a lot of these article-based subscribed resources. A lot of different commercial products out there. I'm not going to talk about any of them in particular. I have a page on my website, discovery.pl, that talks about those and you can explore those a bit more. Um, I would also say that public and academic libraries have pretty radically different needs when it comes to discovery. That public libraries need kind of triggers of engagement to bring people in the library, get them interested, allow them to, in a social media kind of way, make recommendations to each other, consume other folks' recommendations, kind of just spark engagement. Whereas in academic libraries, it's about scholarly information, mostly articles. Uh, so the phase that we've been in for the last few years is this advancement, what I would say, from local discovery to what's often called web scale um, discovery, where compared to the days of where you were doing well to take a federated search and query a few servers, today it's no big deal to just take all of that data and index it. We've heard several times in the course of the symposium so far about kind of how large the realm of cloud computing scales to. So when you think of a lot of these article level indexes, you know, they're past a billion. Well, a billion is nothing relative to the technologies available today. Uh, so it's entirely feasible to think that any discovery system, uh, if you have the time and the platform to build it on, you know, can at, at the article level, index every article that a library subscribes to. To index every article that the library community as a whole subscribes to and scope it to your library. That's actually how most of them work. Um, so, you know, I think that's a pretty important advancement. So when you can have 
Can kind of this be the front door to your collection where you're building a consolidated index comprised of everything that you consider your collection, then that's a pretty good front door, I think, where it may not work perfectly, and I think that's kind of where the state of the art is being worked out today, but you have a chance to expose not just your print collection, but all these articles that you're spending most of your money subscribing to, the digital objects that you're that you're creating every day, open access materials, uh, even from the resources that you don't subscribe to. That's kind of the point, right? Uh, reference resources, you know, you, there's nothing about today's technology that doesn't scale to be able to fulfill this vision. Unfortunately, there are things other than technology in play. You know, it takes cooperation by content producers to be able to offer their resources to a discovery service provider to plow them into that index. Uh, most do these days, some don't. There are more and more kind of complicated business arrangements that you end up with kind of leftovers that your get any given discovery system is not going to be able to include. Uh, I think that's kind of the, the glaring problem with uh, library resource discovery today is non-participation and limited participation. Uh, what is indexed at what level and what's not? You know, when I say you can index a billion things, I'm not also just talking about citation data. I'm talking about the full text of the things. So how many of the resources are being indexed with metadata, also with full text and so forth? I think you have to have both together to work well. It's hard to build facets with full text alone, for example. So, um, at, you know, having the full text or not is something that you need to know as you kind of select a discovery system. Is it mostly built out of citations or is it mostly built out of full text? Uh, there's lots of full text on the book site available these days. Hottie Trust alone can give you 3.5 billion pages. And this is an old slide. I think that it's like in the 4 billion pages now. So all of that can be within your discovery systems. So, you know, you don't have to underwhelm your patrons so much anymore. You have lots and lots of data. I often get asked, well, don't, uh, isn't that kind of information overload? How many people complain when they type a search in in Google? Oh, it gave me too much. You know, as long as it gives you the right things first, then I, nobody's going to complain about how deep the result set is. You know, the, but it's that magic of, you know, how good is that first page or so of results. How do you make it the best relevancy possible? Well, you certainly don't do it by matching up keywords. Because when you have indexes of this size, you can have hundreds of thousands of result candidates that match up just fine by keywords. And the least important things will match up better than the core things because, you know, it's not like my classic Harry Potter example. If you go into a library system and type in the words Harry Potter, what is it that you probably want? The last Harry Potter book. But if you're just going by keywords alone, it's going to give you all the articles and books about Harry Potter before it gets to, you know, the actual thing itself. So how, what are all the other clues that you build into relevancy, maybe related to how often the thing circulates? What's its, you know, different scholarly index? You know, what are, how has it been linked to in link resolvers? All these other social use related clues that tell you what that kind of magic first 10 things ought to be or not. So, you know, that again is where the state of the art of discovery, I think, is being worked out these days. Uh, and then to know how do we close the gaps on collection coverage, uh, to close the gaps and have libraries be able to evaluate systems based on the coverage relative to their collection and the objectivity of the coverage relative to their collection. I'm a co-chair of the uh, NISO group that's called the Open Discovery Initiative. This is a group that uh, is working to address some of these issues. Uh, how do we uh, uh, come up with a set of recommended practices uh, for discovery service creators, content providers, and libraries related to this ecosystem of discovery? How can we make it better to maybe get closer to accomplishing the ideal that, that it has to if we're going to depend on these systems as at least one of the initial strategic ways that patrons access our collections? Uh, don't have time to talk about a lot of the details, but you can see the main uh, constituents and that we've uh, 
had in mind. Ebooks is really important in anything that, patri that faces patrons these days as the world changes uh, increasingly from print monographs to electronic uh, ebooks. You've got to be able to master all of the things in library lending that we've always done in print, but now do it in electronic and we're swimming upstream. We have legal barriers, we have business barriers. Uh, the technology problems, I think, are becoming uh, addressed better. You know, when you think most libraries, they subscribe to an ebook system like Overdrive or 3M. And so, what is the interface for the library to that? An eject button. Go to 3M and see what they have, and good luck, and uh, 30 steps to downloading your first ebook. So fortunately, that was a couple of years ago. There's been a lot of work, really good work done in the last couple of years about exposing APIs related to ebook discovery and lending. Those have been built into online catalogs and discovery systems. And more and more of the ebook providers, including OverDrive, are opening up all of the APIs that you need to bring that full experience back into the library instead of uh, ejecting them away from your website. So I think that's being done. I think there's a lot of work left to do. But especially for public libraries today, that is kind of the seminal issue that I hear about uh, from libraries. Uh, if you haven't already, look at the Readers First initiative, readersfirst.org. It's kind of a series of, I would say, almost mandates that libraries are making regarding their expectations for ebook lending. So pretty important stuff. I want to turn next to how libraries organize themselves relative to their automation environments and the way that they provide access to their collections to patrons. So the standard way that we've been doing library automation systems is within a system of libraries, whether it's a like municipal system with branches, an academic library with you know kind of different facilities, specialized libraries. For a long time, we've been having library management systems that handle all of that just fine. It's pretty easy to configure and to operate, and it has built-in functionality so that a patron at one facility can request materials from another. Concepts of direct borrowing, uh, floating collections are pretty mature in the realm of library management systems these days when you have multiple facilities operating within a single instance of a library management system. There's kind of well-established and very expensive approaches to borrowing things that aren't available in your library. You know, for a total cost of, what is it, $27? Uh, uh, borrowing a book from a service provider like uh, OCL, say you can get materials that you don't own um, if you're willing to kind of pay those costs and wait a while. More and more libraries are organized together in some kind of borrowing consortia so that Unrelated libraries, libraries that each have their own automation system, can do direct consortial borrowing from one library and its branches to a, another library and its branches. And there's kind of messy, I would say, technology available to do that. Uh, but you think that within this capability, you have you know all of these separate automation systems, operating libraries, kind of, you know, um, Big and little, you have to have some central middleware and union catalog to do discovery, and then you have kind of these dozens of INSIP transactions that have to take place for every single request. Looks a little fragile, it is a little fragile, uh, but it more or less works. Um, but in the same way that MetaSearch and Z350 had inherent limitations, I would say this model likewise has inherent limitations. How many partners can you put together in a direct consortial management system? I would see that the movement today is toward shared infrastructure that includes libraries that aren't related to each other. It's actually not that new of a model, but it's a model that I see being embraced more and more. So instead of having different branches that are shared within a library management systems, it's different libraries, each with their own branches. Uh, and you know, when you think of kind of the simplest, more elegant approach, I think this wins a bit over this. And scale is not an issue these days as it might have been in the past. You know, how many systems can you, how many library systems, how many branches, how many records, how many patrons can be managed within a single library management system? I think the upper limits are, are quite high, 
Uh, I think that we're kind of pushing those up all of the time uh, to kind of state and national levels. More and more, I think libraries are looking for ways to strategically cooperate because in these days of reduced budgets, we can't buy everything that we need. We can't afford to each have our own isolated automation systems. It's better, cheaper, more feasible to partner and get a piece of a library management system at a higher kind of level of sophistication than buy a simple PC-based system maybe that you can afford on your own. So we see a lot of movement toward increased participation and shared infrastructure in all kinds of relationships. Uh, we see more and more libraries kind of expanding uh, their size in order to be able to, to leverage scale a little bit more. Uh, one example I pulled out is the Auckland City Libraries where the library services surrounding it have joined uh, seven additional services. I think it kind of doubled the size of, of the library uh, system. Uh, you see, this is a system that's made out of the middleware approach, um, you know, where still each library has their own separate library management system, direct consortial borrowing enabled through a middleware system, happens to be Millennium's in reach, uh, to be able to do effective um, direct consortial borrowing from patrons of one library to another. So this is held up. This has been in place for 20 years or so. Um, it's probably not a model that, uh, you know, it's still, it's still being used, but you know, there are probably alternatives as well. Uh, you see more and more examples of national infrastructure. One I would point out is in Iceland, uh, where they have a single instance of an automation system that serves pretty much all the libraries in, in the country. School, public, special, government, you know, they all, they're about 400 all together, so the number isn't astronomic, but indeed they all share a single system. And you know, I, I mentioned what systems are being used, but you'll see a lot of different ones. I would say that most of the major systems scale these days to these very expansive uh, scope simply because of kind of the infinite hardware and clustering resources available today. Uh, South Australia, one library card, you know, they have this program, one LMS for the state. So they've migrated from 60 or so library management systems into one. Uh, the country of Chile, for all of their public libraries, even these in very remote areas uh, are moving, have mostly moved, I think the, the implementation is largely complete, for you know, automation using one system with the viewfind front end um, you know, for, for patron access. Georgia Pines is a famous example where all of the uh, rural libraries in a state have banded together to use this evergreen open source system which has also been developed and marketed uh, outside of Georgia. You know, it is a pretty, pretty large system. You know, 275 libraries being served by that system, uh, but not the urban region. So that, that's kind of the rub in Georgia is that the system has not been able to expand to the urban areas simply because, you know, the same software in some cases that works fine for small libraries isn't necessarily what's going to be palatable to, to a municipal system. Uh, as you know, your friends in Northern Ireland have recently uh, joined their four uh, regional systems into one, uh, originally on Axial's uh, Open Galaxy, and more recently they've signed with Circe Dynix to uh, use that system. A uh, couple of other interesting cases. So the Orbis Cascade Alliance is a group of 37 academic libraries in the United States that are in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. These are mostly separate libraries. There's some public, there are some private libraries. They range in size from library, from uh, colleges that serve 1,000 students to those that serve like 50,000, I forget what the University of Washington has. Uh, so they've gone through various iterations of resource sharing, uh, starting with kind of the uh, middleware approach that, that we've seen in two instances of, they've combined those. Um, more recently, they've decided that they want to move to a single uh, automation system that's shared by all the libraries. So pretty radical change for each of these 37 libraries to say, we're not going to run our own automation system as we have in the past, but rather the most effective way to share our resources would be by having a, a shared automation system. So uh, they uh, opted for uh, Alma and their phasing in the migration of, of that now. 
Uh, interesting thing happening in Denmark. They've recently gone through a procurement for all the public libraries for a national system. Uh, the procurement, I think, is finally complete. It was awarded to a Danish company called Dantec. Uh, Axial isn't too happy about that. They have a lot of the incumbent systems. There's been various kind of contractual uh, issues going on that I think are now resolved in favor of Dantec. Uh, Ireland, uh, uh, as you may or may not know, there's conversations going on regarding a national system for the public libraries, uh, joining all of the uh, four in Dublin plus all of the other library services uh, throughout the country. Another interesting example is the Two Cool project, uh, where Columbia University and Cornell University, which are two kind of highly competitive Ivy League universities in the United States, they compete with each other for students, for grant funding, for faculty, you know, so the highly competitive organizations. Yet they've decided their libraries are going to cooperate. They've been doing shared collection development in specific subject areas for a while. They have recently launched a program to have a single technical services department that will process materials for both of those libraries. And ultimately, I think the thinking is a single automation system for the two library systems. In another state in the US, um, there were five separate consortial systems that joined together into one. Um, so now it's automating, I think, 585 libraries in a single instance of a library management system. So again, pretty large scale systems that are sprouting up instead of a lot of separate systems. So I would say the world of discovery is really working more toward kind of web scale indexing and higher and higher consolidation of libraries that use those systems. How am I doing on time? Okay? Okay. Okay, I'll start wrapping up. I want to talk just for a minute on the back end of things. Uh, I've never run out of things to say. <laughs> but let's talk about the back end just for a minute. And I would say that in the same way that the front end of library management systems, of, of library websites have been fragmented, the back end has even been more fragmented. How many pieces and parts and components do you need to automate a library these days? Uh, I'm not going to read the list, but I'm sure your library has a lot of these. It, we would have never invented this, right? If we'd taken a step back and said, well, how would we automate a library today? It naturally would take into consideration the shape of libraries today. Print, electronic, digital, uh, licensed resources, owned resources, uh, published, unpublished. You know, you would build a system around that and you would have mostly a comprehensive system in the same way that the current integrated library system or library management system was done in the 1970s around the reality of libraries then at, at that time. They were comprehensive. Well, they're not comprehensive for today. We've had to build all of these other things to fill in the gaps of what library management systems don't do. Uh, so library automation systems, and then how do we latch it up to electronic resource management systems? Well, you don't very well. This model never worked. I would say most academic libraries today manage this 80% of resources that they spend their collection dollars on in very informal kinds of ways. The idea of separate electronic resource management has not caught on. There are a few hundred electronic resource management systems that have been purchased and deployed compared to 100,000 or so library management systems. That's way out of sync with reality. And still, there's lots of gaps. How many of you have halfway decent software to manage your public services operation, for example? What we want is something that's more comprehensive in the way that libraries are it handles library management workflows. Uh, I'll make these slides available, and obviously I, just, I don't read uh, all that's on them anyway, uh, but we need our systems to do a lot more than they have in the past, and this pieces and parts approach doesn't serve libraries very well, I think. Uh, there's a new genre of systems that's emerging that indeed aims to be more comprehensive and typically uh, deployed through a uh, web-based platform. Um, didn't know what to call these. I don't want to call them integrated library systems or library management systems because of all the baggage behind those terms. I coined the term library services platform to describe this new genre of software that I think takes a pretty fundamentally different approach than what we've seen in the past. Uh, highly shared data models, you know, it, it no, 
uh, you know, it has knowledge bases instead of library-specific data stores designed to be deployed through multi-tenant software as a service, more unified workflows across different kinds of library materials, and you know, knows how to manage all kinds of metadata formats, including the ones that haven't quite been invented yet. So I think it's important to have that kind of flexibility and, of course, to open up the APIs to let you do with it uh, as you need to. Some of the systems are on the market today. Uh, this is, I'll stop with this slide here. This is more the vision of what I think the back end of a library ought to look like, where you have a given system that's your business system that's kind of the core of what automates your library that's built you know, in, in a, in a service-oriented way that exposes APIs so you can connect with other systems within your environment, within your partner's environment, and wherever else you need to, to incorporate discovery, to latch into you know, payment systems, authentication services. So in other words, it's not a monolithic, let's do it all kind of closed system, but a more comprehensive and service-oriented system that can kind of serve as decent middleware for everything that you might want to do, both in the library and you know, toward you know, facing your, your patron services as well. So uh, let me stop there, and maybe we have time for a question or two. Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of a balancing act, isn't it? So when you have, like universities increasingly have enterprise uh, infrastructure, you've got to connect with your course management system, with your ERP system, authentication system. So there's a lot of this kind of integration you've got to do on a campus. And then you think, well, above campus, you know, we want to be able to share resources as well. So is it conceivable to have systems that are good at enterprise interoperability at the campus level, yet are kind of more broadly based across consortium. I see a trend toward that, but I also see that it's kind of largely untested. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how it plays out. I think that the, the, you know, you think of maybe the couple of vendors that focus on systems for academic libraries, you know, they're, they're working on that and have some maybe deployments underway and kind of see how that goes. How do you be both a consortia and an enterprise at the same time? Kind of tricky. No magic answer. I might take the opportunity then to ask the last question. Okay. Um, I think um, the uh, linked library data yeah. issue um, is going to be quite important, yes. even though we have you know, several uh, school services, etc. When it comes to actually intelligent provision mm -hmm. for material that's already available in the library, it doesn't work like that. For instance, you might pay lots of money for it. You expect that your discovery service may not be able to actually pinpoint that it's already available mm -hmm. there. So, what do you think uh, the future of the library data um, you know, incorporated into all this sophisticated uh, uh, infrastructure? Great question, and, and one that I would have talked about if I had, <laughs> that I had in mind to, to talk about, but I skipped. 
so as we all know, some of the most interesting conversations that are going on in libraries today have to do with open link data. Uh, when you look at you know, big digital library projects like Europeana and the uh, Digital Public Library of America, when you think about the bib frame conversations, uh, the research that OCLC is doing, everything is pointing toward linked data as what is going to happen next. Most of what I've talked about today involves kind of built indexes and relational databases, you know, kind of at a larger scale. But no, that's certainly the next thing. I think that we're at a phase now where linked data is being exper it's experimental and operational in some cases. And you look at Gripiana and Digital Public Library of America as examples of operationalized linked data. We've got to operationalize it at another level too within the automation systems that libraries have, but especially at the discovery systems. So right now when I talk to folks who build discovery systems, they say that linked data just doesn't help us that much yet. But, well, because of their, their, their current designs, but they're all thinking about how to incorporate that in kind of future architecture. So I think they all know that if they don't support linked data in the library realm, they're all kind of going to be sunk. Uh, so I would say that, you know, thinking about, you know, how fast things happen in, in the library realm, I would expect to see things starting to happen in the next year or two, and maybe within the next three or four kind of being kind of operationally part of the way that discovery systems work, if I were to stick my neck out and project where things are going. Uh, I would also say that a lot of local projects that use linked data will lead the way. In fact, that's where you see a lot of the interesting work with linked data is kind of going on in national libraries, some big academic libraries, and so forth. Um, so how do, how do you do linked data at scale? How do you do linked data uh, with kind of high, with fast transaction performance? All those kinds of things. So I think that, I think the state of the art will work itself, work itself out and in that direction. Okay, thank you very okay, much. You're